When I was a kid, my next door neighbor worked for Spalding. Uh, now, the company is best known for their basketballs and other sort of sporting paraphernalia. Lots of sports balls, if you will. Uh, which was really cool because he would often give me and, and my family free samples. Like, I had a cool basketball, I had a cool uh, American-style football. So it was great. Like, I loved it. But when I was about 10, he switched jobs and went to work for Oneida Limited. Now, for those of you outside the U.S., that name might not mean much. But for anyone from the U.S., if you've ever turned over a piece of silverware while out to dinner, you have probably seen the name Oneida stamped on the back of a spoon. That's because Oneida Limited is the largest supplier of dinnerware to the food service industry in North America and one of the largest designers and sellers of cutlery and tableware in the world. And this massive company that aims to bring families together at a nice traditional table started life as a cult. Hi everyone, I'm Taylor. I'm Kat and this is Square Mile of Murder. And welcome to the very first of our Cults Month episodes. Today we're strolling all the way back to the 1840s to examine the Oneida community. There's really no better way to start this story than by going right back to the beginning and talking about the man who began it all. So here we go! John Humphrey Noyes was born on September 3rd, 1811 in Brattleboro, Vermont to Father John Noyes and Mother Polly Noyes, who, who was born Polly Hayes. John Noyes was a man of many professions and worked as a minister, teacher, businessman and as a member of the US House of Representatives. Polly Noyes was the aunt of Rutherford B. Hayes, the 19th President of the United States. Who would be president in the late 1800s. So, I guess at this point, future president. <laughs> so the area of Vermont where Noyes was born was an interesting one. Uh, the area was home to good farming land around the Connecticut River Valley, and this part of Vermont was also the site of constant religious revolution. So following the Revolutionary War, many conservative Calvinists settled in southern Vermont. Calvinism is also called Reformed Christianity or Reformed Protestantism, and we're not theologians. Uh, but as far as we can understand, Calvinism is a branch of Protestantism formed in the 16th century. And we're not going to go into the whole history of Calvinism because it's long and complicated, but just know that Calvinism led to many of the major Protestant sects we know of today and found strong footholds in Europe and the United Kingdom. The Calvinist theology found particular popularity with English Puritans, and as such, eventually became very popular in North America at the beginning of the 17th century. Because nothing those American settlers love more than a good Puritanism. Well, wasn't that part of why they chose to settle in the US was like they were Puritans and they didn't like what was going on in England yeah. at the time? Yeah, they split with or the church. I just, or have I just made that up? I can't remember. No, that's exactly right. Um... It was very popular in, like, the 1600s. Most of the, like, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, that was a Puritan settlement. Polly Noyes, for her part, was a strict Calvinist and was intensely religious. And I, I will put a, a little asterisk starting here. It's very hard to find information about John Humphrey Noyes' early life. And in my research... I found about seven different names of siblings and none of them lined up in any source. <laughs> so I just picked some. They might not be correct. <laughs> mm. So we'll see. So prior to the birth of her first son, Polly and John had three daughters whom might have been called Mary, Elizabeth, and Joanna. I've also seen Charlotte. Somewhere in there. I don't know. Do you know what's quite amusing? So I have a friend who I'm actually meeting up with tomorrow, which I'm very excited about. Because, mm. you know, 
haven't seen anyone in months. <laughs> her sister's called Joanna, her mum's called Elizabeth, and her I think her grandmother's called Mary, and she has a cousin called Charlotte. See, there you go. See, I think I think you're gonna have so, to have to confirm here. Um, Maybe she knows about the noise family tree. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask her tomorrow yeah. when we're eating chips on the pier. Oh, sounds good. Uh, tomorrow I'm getting stabbed in the arm for science and safety. Yay! Yay! I've never been so happy to have been poked by a sharp object. Um, There's not a lot you can say to that, really, is there? Yeah, so following the birth of her three daughters who had names that may or may not be the names that I just said. Um, following Joanna's birth, Polly fell into a severe depression and feared that she was going insane, which is not uh, uncommon in uh, after giving birth. But at the time, we didn't talk about those things. Mm. Uh, so she turned... I mean, they still don't talk about it now. I mean, true. So, you know. Uh, she turned to prayer and asked God for relief. And he delivered, so to speak, because Polly soon became pregnant and gave birth to John Humphrey Noyes. Now, this birth took on a very religious aura, and Polly saw her son as the reason she was lifted out of her depression. So she decided to devote her life to the religious upbringing of said son. And with her husband, John Noyes, often away on business, Polly more or less raised John Humphrey by herself focusing super duper hard on his morality like real morality or biblical morality because it's not the same thing definitely biblical mm yeah that kind of morality yeah by all accounts noise was a delicate child who had trouble building an identity for himself outside his mother uh when he was 3 he fell into a tub of boiling laundry water and was badly burnt. During the time it took him to heal, he became even more dependent on Polly. He was also shy, lacked self-confidence, and suffered from severe social anxiety, which ran in his family, but was referred to as the Atkinson Difficulty, based on the name of the New Hampshire town where John Noyes hailed from. I just love that. It's like, it's a whole town, and they're super awkward. Uh, when he began school, he was a good student, but had trouble fitting in. His mother took him to his first religious revival at the age of eight, and he enjoyed his time there. Okay, what is a religious revival? Because it sounds very American. Well, if you read the next sentence. Oh. See, this is why you should read ahead. <laughs> Uh, for those of us, like me, not versed in the lingo, a revival is a gathering that includes several religious services. The services are held to inspire current church members, to convert new followers, or to bring new followers into the faith. Noise, at just eight, decided to convert. But because he was so young, his devotion to the church wasn't seen as binding. Only an adult could truly give themselves over to God. Yeah. That line of thought has got very twisted over the last couple of hundred years oh yeah for sure and i think that was very much a like um calvinist this type of conservative calvinist thinking because they were very much all about like conscious devotion like like probably mm. a eight-year-old didn't quite un like understand the weight of of his sins and the weight of which he needed to repent for kind of thing yeah so like an informed choice rather yes. than just blind faith yes yeah exactly um which is what religion has become about yeah in a lot of places now is just blind devotion yeah exactly and it, it's interesting yeah so like a revival <laughs> as far as i understand because like i've been aware of them my whole life but not really understood the inner workings because i've never been to one um but yeah it's like a big party out in a field in a tent and y'all go talk about how great god is and sometimes that they're they're so convincing that you're just like you know what i love god too i'll join you guys very cultish uh-huh and they were apparently very popular in this part of new england 
at the time. So it was just like a revival happening everywhere. You're quite an anomaly for New England. I know. <laughs> Everything you tell me about New England, I'm like, how 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 did we get you from that? Well, to be fair, my parents are from California, so I think that helped. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, and that revival was in Putney, Vermont. Uh, so John Noyes went away to boarding school in Amherst, Massachusetts at just nine years old, as was the tradition of the time. Perhaps expectedly, he was terribly homesick the whole time he was there. But that's okay because he didn't need to stay there for long because the Noyes family soon moved to Putney, Vermont, uh, where John Noyes retired to, quote, focus on the education of his children, which now included another two sons, possibly named George and William, and another daughter, possibly named Harriet. It's unclear. Really wish this wasn't as confusing. <laughs> I mean, they, we get used to these like old cases, which we both really like doing. Yeah. But we get used to there being like a discrepancy in dates and things. Yeah. But you don't usually get such a discrepancy in names. Literally, though. And to make this even more confusing, apparently the son, George, died at age like 15. And then they changed the son, William's name to George. In honor of him. That doesn't sound like in honor. That's like, okay, well, the favorite died, so we're going to make you you're, be like You're him. George now. <laughs> yeah. It was weird and a confusing. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so John Noyes was very concerned about the education of all of these various children. And, yeah, sure. Um... Polly had chosen uh, Putney to move to because of the town's religious fervor and basically because she felt that the town was, like, extra holy. Like Swiss cheese. I mean, probably. More likely, but, you know. Uh, so, uh, John Humphrey was moved to Brattleboro Academy to be closer to his family in Putney. And it was there that he finished out his studies before heading to college in September 1826 at age 15, which was not common. So he was a he was a a good academic student. Um mm. just That's young. Yeah. And like he was one of the younger people in his college cohort. His father wanted him to go to Yale. However, his mother thought that Dartmouth was a better religious fit. So off to Dartmouth he went. But they're both really prestigious universities, aren't oh, they? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like Ivy. Yes. Yeah. I, Ivy League. Yeah, Dartmouth is an Ivy, yeah. But, shockingly, young John Humphrey didn't enjoy his time at Dartmouth. He still struggled with intense shyness and wanted, but often failed, to assert himself. After four years, he graduated and decided to go into a career in law, not the ministry, as his mother had expected of him. Uh, while working as a lawyer, he fell in love with a young woman named Caroline, and he wanted to ask her to marry him. But he was too scared, and so he hightailed it back home to Putney instead. It's a very extreme reaction to being scared to ask a lass out. I mean... Yeah, a little bit. But what of his budding law career, you say? Well, it turns out he was a bad lawyer. His first attempt at arguing in court was a debacle. He was scared to death and stammered and trembled through the whole thing. So disheartened with both his lack of love and lack of law, <laughs> he returned home to Putney. And it was here in 1831 that the first glimmers of the Oneida community began to form. Noyes attended a revival in Putney that strengthened his faith and set him down the path his mother had always wanted him to follow. The ministry. He enrolled at Andover Theological Seminary in 1831 and began his study. But he didn't really like Andover. I'm shocked. Yeah. Are we sensing a theme here? think we might be. 
He found the lectures boring and felt the course of study didn't leave him enough time for his favourite leisure activity, which was reading the Bible. Of course, whose who's favourite activity isn't? <laughs> Alright, I know it's mine. He became obsessed with finding answers to his daily struggles within the Bible, applying whatever he read to the problem at hand. Kind of like spinning a globe and stopping it with your finger and deciding, that's where you're going to go on holiday next. Yeah. Noise turned to the Bible to help him decide if he should leave Andover for Yale. Okay. Yeah. He was on the fence, so he randomly opened the Bible and landed on Matthew 28, uh, 5, 6, which read, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. So off he went to New Haven to attend Yale and study under the popular lecturer Nathaniel William Taylor. Taylor's brand of theology became wildly popular with students. It combined conservative Calvinist beliefs with more liberal ideas. While strict Calvinism taught that man was made in God's image but tainted by sin and only through repenting could that sin be resolved, Taylor preached that man was not inherently sinful but that man was capable of making a choice between sin and virtue. Is how I understood it. There's a big, yeah, big asterisk on all this religious stuff, because I am I am not well-versed in it. (laughs) Well, this is just our interpretation for when we start our own cult. Yeah, 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 yeah. The cult of introverts. Yes, cult of staying home. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Um, So Noyes studied at Yale from 1832 to 1834, and it was there that he finally gained some self-confidence. He became a persuasive and forceful debater and ultimately earned a license to preach after debating Dr. Taylor himself, which is pretty impressive. Mm. Uh, He also found time for other activities besides his fave lonely Bible study, which is probably good. Uh, He even helped found an anti-slavery society in New Haven, which was one of the first in the country. Interesting. Uh, So this is 30 years prior to the Civil War. Uh, It was during his studies at Yale that Noyes first discovered the religious concept of perfectionism. And this is a... Get ready for this. During his second year at Yale, Noyes was attempting to figure out the exact date of the second coming of Christ, which, like, who among us hasn't spent an afternoon doing that? Am I right? Well, I thought it was the Mayan prophecy back in 2012, but clearly I was wrong. I know. I mean, hey. Although, was it wrong? I mean, everything has gone downhill in the last nine years, hasn't it? That's true. You know, many have been wrong before, so you're not alone. (laughs) Uh, But during this process of trying to calculate this out, he decided that this super duper important event uh, had already happened in 70 AD. And as such, mankind was now living in a new age. Right. So 70 AD. So this is 70 years after Jesus' birth. Yeah. Jesus was like 34 when he was knocked off. Yeah, so just like 30 so years later. So he basically came back 36 years after he died. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Next. <laughs> uh, now, uh, in this realization, uh, and unlike many interpretations that see the second coming of Christ as a doomsday, judgment day sort of event, Noyes believed that because Christ had already returned, one could achieve, quote unquote, perfection or lead a life without sin while still on earth and not have to wait for the afterlife. Handy. Convenient. (laughs) Now, it's kind of a lot to wrap your head around. Perfectionism. It's quite a lofty label. Uh, But basically, Noyes decided that he was quote-unquote perfect and without sin, and he found great relief with this decision. You see, his whole life he had suffered from many physical and mental ailments, Uh, But after deciding he was perfect, all those issues just kind of melted away. It's nice. Must Mm. be nice. And apparently he went around telling everyone how perfect he was and how great perfectionism was. Because eventually he was expelled from Yale for being a Christian perfectionist. And this also led to his brand new preaching license being revoked. (laughs) 
Go so figure. now he's a martyr. Yeah. But that didn't stop him. He had seen the light and he wasn't about to slow down. Maybe if I like just keep thinking that I'm perfect, like all my health problems might go away. Hey, it worked for him. Mm, enough to get right on that. Yeah. Noise returned to Putney and began to preach his new concept of perfectionism, and it caught on quickly. By 1836, Noise had started the Putney Bible School to spread his teachings. Uh, the details about the early years of this Putney religious community get a bit fuzzy, uh, but we imagine he was just preaching away, convincing more people uh, that they too were perfect and could bring about the kingdom of heaven right here on God's green earth. Sounds good, sign me up. It sounds great. In 1838, Noyes married a woman named Harriet Holton, after converting her to the idea of perfectionism. And during the first six years of their marriage, Harriet gave birth five times, but had only one surviving child. Noyes noticed the distress this caused Harriet, which, you know, yeah... Five out of six of your kids dying would be a bit distressful. Bit, bit rough. And he began intense research into sex within marriage. He wanted to find a way for his wife to enjoy sex without having to worry about becoming pregnant again. Uh, to achieve this goal, initially, Noyes and his wife lived separately, starting in 1844, which they both reported brought them a lot of happiness. Which... This may be a sign they shouldn't have been married to begin with, but that's not how they took it. Right, yeah, okay, so we're all happy now we've split up, so clearly the marriage is working. Yeah. Yeah. And it was during this time that Noyes began his work developing the idea of male continence. Yeah. And here is where we get to the first of Noyes' fairly progressive beliefs. The idea of male continence sometimes called sometimes also called coitus reservatus. Yeah. Skipped Latin that day. <laughs> Same. It is fairly simple. Uh, let me use the Wikipedia description. During intercourse, the penetrative partner does not attempt to ejaculate within the receptive partner, but instead attempts to remain at the plateau phase of heightened sexual excitement for as long as possible. Yet these days I think that's called edging. Yes, basically. It's it's a bit of like edging, like tantric kind of stuff, but like for Jesus, you know? This technique allowed Noise and Harriet to enjoy sex without worrying about another difficult pregnancy, an early form of birth control. So it's... Yeah, it's 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 like edging, and it's like the like pulling out and the rhythm method all yeah, combined. Yeah, exactly. Except they were like, just don't, just don't orgasm, just like yeah. just keep it all inside forever. Think think of Jesus. Yeah, just think of Jesus real hard, <laughs> and it'll keep you real hard. <laughs> oh this god. Con this concept of male sexual continence became one of the major foundations of the Oneida community, which was officially formed in 1844. This episode is... It's wild, I tell you. <laughs> I... This is where I'm glad that I didn't have time to read through the script <laughs> before, because I'm just, I'm just discovering this along with everyone else. See, it's great fun. It's great fun. Also, like, I attempted about three different times to write out a definition of male sexual continence that did not just copy and paste Wikipedia. But I was like, I can't do this, so I'm just <laughs> gonna put what they said. <laughs> One cannot. <laughs> um, so, so, noise is busy getting his rocks not off, I guess. Uh, and... <laughs> By 1844, he had converted enough people to his beliefs in Putney that the Putney Bible School morphed into a communal living society. Uh, there were about 40 converts to his faith, mostly farmers, and they called themselves, appropriately enough, the Putney Community. Uh, the group followed Noyes' teachings of perfectionism as well as male sexual continence. 
Uh, and they also followed many other traditional communal living ideas like working for the good of com the community, not just for the individual, and raising the children within the community as a group, not in uh, individual families. So. So far, so good. Yeah, it's like not bad. Uh, but, you know, pretty soon, Noise came up with the concept that really... If a group of adults were all living communally and working to build a perfect society together, and if all those adults liked having sex within their marriages without reproducing, then surely those adults would enjoy having sex with people they weren't married to. Oh, would you look at that? Yeah, it's like, it's like a whole thing. Uh, but obviously, you can't be perfect and without sin if you're an adulterer. So... What's a budding cult leader to do? Well, the answer is simple, really. Complex marriage. Sounds like a great plan. Here's how it works. Every man within the community is married to every woman, and every woman to every man. So anyone can have sex with anyone else, but heterosex only, please. It's still the 1840s, after all. Uh, and all this is kosher because they're all married. And ironically enough considering the talk of all this talk of marriage, the idea for this noise claimed was based on Jesus's teachings that there were no marriages in heaven. So I guess by having no marriages, you could also have all marriages. It's a bit of a square rectangle situation. I'm confused. Yeah. I think he was too. He was just so horny for Jesus that he's like, just need... No, he, he was horny for all the other women. That's the thing. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> but no, like, it's... call a spade a spade. That's what was going on. It's for Jesus. It's what Jesus wants. Isn't it obvious? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, the original uh, vision of Jesus, as in the Bible, versus what uh, evangelical Christians have twisted Jesus to mean. Yeah. Jesus probably was into free love and all that. Oh, yeah. He seemed like a bit of a hippie to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's what they started doing. Everyone was just married to everyone. Uh, and because they were perfect, the members of the community didn't bother hiding their beliefs about sex or marriage, which, of course, scandalized the Vermonters around them. Uh, and as all good New Englanders are wont to do when faced with something that butts up against tradition, the residents of Putney, Vermont, grabbed their pitchforks and formed an angry mob to run these radicals out of town. Yeah, of course. Uh, they arrested Noyes for adultery, and after he was released on bail, Noyes decided it was time to hightail it out of there. He and the Putney community picked up stakes and headed to Oneida, New York where Noyes knew some friendly perfectionists with plenty of land. It was there in 1848 that the community settled for good and formed the community of the Oneida Perfectionists. The group initially lived out of an old hut and sawmill that had been left by the Oneida Indians while working the land and building up their community. In no time at all, the group had several different businesses up and running to help support their communal lifestyle. They fixed up the old sawmill and began selling lumber to nearby farmers. They set up a printing office and distributed free paper to the locals. And John Humphrey Noyes, man of philosophy and lofty ideas, even took up blacksmithing. Yeah. I mean, it's good to have a trade. Yeah. It was here that the Oneida community showed the first hint of their future legacy. In the blacksmith shop, the community produced animal traps but they had no money for machinery, so they made them by hand, and they soon earned a reputation of having exquisitely made traps. Pretty soon, this became the bulk of their business, and the group began to thrive. Unlike in Putney, the locals in New York generally welcomed the perfectionists, and many locals were actually employed to work by the group. By 1870, the Oneida community was one of the largest employers in the region. That's quite interesting because... When we think of a cult, we think of them as being, like, really insular. Yeah. And, like, obviously smaller cults will, like, make things and they'll go sell things at markets. Yes. 
and things like that but you don't think of them as having like an actual organized business yeah that's what kind of makes these guys different and also the fact that like they were isolated and they were insular but they also were a major part of this like local society as well in in new york so yeah they kind of like straddle that line a little bit yeah and this is new york state yes not- upstate yeah but it's near syracuse so it's it's like yeah. middle of the state it's, basically yeah it's between syracuse and utica yeah Sorry. So yeah, they just they just came inland from Vermont, really. Basically, yeah, they because that's about the same latitude that Putney is on. Um, so they just kind of went west, <laughs> straight line. Anyway, now we've cleared that up. They bought more land, and in 1848, built a large communal house for everyone to live in. They called this the Mansion House. Uh. Let's check in on what everyone was up to while living in that big house. We know that they were practicing complex marriage and sexual continence. The group also shared all work duties with people rotating through different jobs. Women usually took on domestic duties, but not always. Quote unquote skilled members often kept individual jobs. For example, the group's finance manager remained the same. They rotated people through the quote unquote unskilled jobs. And they raised children as a group. Yeah. Let's remember, kids, there is no such thing as unskilled work, just undervalued skills. Yes, exactly. And so, like, the the uh, examples given for the unskilled labor was, like, farming and, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, that's hard to do. You can't, you need some um, knowledge to do that. Yeah. That's, I mean... Yeah, it's like fruit picking. Things like that is classed as like low level unskilled work and it's like, no, you need to be incredibly fit to do that yeah. job. Oh god, yeah. You need to know exactly what you're looking for, make sure you don't pick like the stuff that's rotten and things like that, and that you're picking the like the right stuff. I wouldn't have any idea. I couldn't do it. No. Like, like And like think about like um they so they had like a lumber mill and they were probably well, they built this house, so they're probably also doing, like, construction. You can't just magically just nail some shit together and you have a house mm. that's livable. Like, you have to figure it out. You have to oh, yeah. have math skills and, you know, spatial awareness and all this stuff. Like, so, yeah. A very classist understanding rippling through the Oneida mm. community here, despite the fact that everyone was equal and perfect and all that stuff yeah go figure some are more perfect than others yes now what about those children who are being raised by a group Uh, with all this free love there were bound to be children born into the group and there were uh but the group was very careful to make a distinction between amative love and propagative love uh, so in simpler terms, sex for fun versus sex for babies. Uh, and the community really couldn't afford a bunch of kiddos running around in the early days. And also the women weren't too keen on the idea of constantly being pregnant. So noises, fave, blue balls technique worked out quite well for everyone. Uh, and <laughs> because of that, they were able to keep the group population under control while still boning like bunnies. <laughs> Isn't that nice for them? Yeah. Uh, but here is where we dive into, again, some of the more culty behaviors of the group. You see, one is not born knowing how to participate in this kind of free love society. So how are these youngsters supposed to know how to control themselves when it comes to sex? Well, Noise had an answer for that, of course. Uh, he decided that the postmenopausal women in the community would act as, quote, sexual mentors to the adolescent boys in the community. And likewise, adult men would, quote, initiate girls into the ways of complex marriage and free love. You know what that sounds like? Pedophilia. Yeah. And rape. Yeah. That sure is 
what it sounds like. Uh, now, Noise often picked these pairings himself. And wouldn't you know, he was pretty fond of making himself the sexual initiator for many, many of the group's young girls. And unfortunately, we're not just talking 18-year-old and up here. We're talking about some girls as young as 10. Fucking hell. Yeah. So, Noise and his community advocated for the repeated rape of young girls and boys. Uh, so, we are now starting to see the dark side of this happy-go-lucky commune. This is the thing about, like, everyone, like people advocate for free love. You can't advocate for one. And demonize the other. Yeah. If you want free love, it has to happen across a scale. And you can't go fucking raping kids well, and, and calling it free love. And that's the other thing, too, that, like... So this whole idea that Noise had of complex marriage, when it started, was very much focused on the idea of consent between the two couples, basically. To I mean, it was basically mm -hmm. like a swinging kind of... Swingers kind of thing. Yeah. But then somehow... <laughs> It then got turned into like, well, if we're all married to one another, then obviously I'm just going to have sex with these young girls. And that whole issue of like adult consent went right yeah. out the window. Another popular fun activity of the group was mutual criticism. Every member of the community was subject to criticism by a committee or by the community as a whole. Doesn't that sound fun? That's a bit like doing a group project in school where you have to do a presentation. Yeah. And then everyone points out what's wrong with yeah. you at the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it basically consisted of one person being singled out and the rest of the group members taking turns listing all the things they didn't like about the person in question. Wow. Yeah. The person had to take this criticism in stride and vow to do better in the future in order to c continue living in the community. It wasn't all bad, though, apparently. The Oneida community gave women a large amount of freedom compared to the wider world at the time. Well, we know all about that. Uh, women within the community were regarded as equals to men, though anyone who wasn't noise was subject to his will. The community's communal childcare allowed women to work outside the home. Many tried their hand within the group's various business ventures and took on craftsmen or sales roles. They also had an active, an active role in shaping the religious and business policy within the group. And women's sexual satisfaction was, was recognised and actively sought out in the community's sexual interactions. So they were allowed to orgasm. Well, that is nice. Yeah. You know, that at some point in history, men did consider that. Right? Go go figure. You know, I, I I struggle with these guys because they're animals, but also, like, they had some good concepts. See, this is how they suck you in. I know. I know. That was a bad choice of words. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> no, but this is how they get you. It's like, yeah. okay, so women are equal to men and women's sexual pleasure is really important and we have childcare so that women can like go work, work and do what they want. But also rape and pedophilia and um stand in the circle and let everyone tell you how much they hate you. <laughs> yeah. So yay women's rights in the Oneida community. However, you didn't think we could leave it there on a good note, did you? <sighs> That's because by the late 1860s, uh, the Oneida community was quite wealthy. They were making bank thanks to all their various businesses and could easily support a new generation of Oneida children being born. And after reading some Plato, some Darwin, and some books by agricultural breeders... I don't like where this is going already. Yeah. Uh, when when you're reading books about agricultural breeding and talking about children, it's not going to be good, is it? Mm. So Noyes decided that the community should start up a program of, quote, scientific propagation to create humans through intentional reproduction rather than haphazard sex. 
Oh, dear Lord. He called this program stirpiculture, and it became one of the earliest forms of eugenics in American history. Fucking hell. Womp womp. Nope. Yep. He went there. So, here's how it worked. <laughs> Noise operated the experiment alongside a committee, because everything was done by committees. Apparently, there were like... At the group's largest, there were about 300 members, but there were like 57 different committees. So, go figure. Uh, did you have a committee of committees? I'm sure. You, like, all the committees had to meet at a committee. I'm sure they did. Which was overseen by a larger committee. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> and That's stopped sounding like a word now, hasn't it? And noise was on every single one of them. <laughs> so, there's a committee. Men and women would be paired up by noise and the committee based on their superior mental and spiritual qualities. Community members and couples could request to have a child, but ultimately the decision and the pairing was up to noise. Uh, he generally favored pairing older men, whom he deemed wiser and more spiritually sound, with younger women, usually be between the ages of 20 and 40. Well... Yeah, that's kind of how reproduction works. You need a woman of childbearing age. Yeah. You don't need the dirty old man. Usually not, but, uh, you know, this is Oneida. We do what the dirty old man wants. Mm. Uh, and in this process, each participant was required to sign a contract committing themselves to the experiment and to God and to his human representative, one John Humphrey Noyes. What do you know? Look how that worked out. Shocked, really. Uh, and by signing this contract, the participant also pledged to avoid, quote, personal feelings in regard to childbearing for the betterment of the community. So... Not only could you not choose who to have children with, but you weren't allowed to form a personal connection with that child once it was born. Yeah, because that's really good for children, isn't it? It's great. This was enforced by the communal child-rearing system. Babies would stay with their mother for 15 months before being sent to the children's house to live. They would still occasionally sleep with their mothers at night, but were quickly weaned out of this and would instead sleep with different members of the community who were frequently switched out. This was to prevent strong attachments forming between adult and child. Noyes believed that a strong attachment between mother and child could cause poor health, illness and or suffering for the child, which couldn't possibly be a reaction to his own overly close relationship with his mother. Right? Just like, not related. Definitely. Mm. The Sterpiculture experiment lasted for 10 years, from 1869 to 1879. During those 10 years, 58 children were born as a result of noise pairings. Most pairings only produced one child, and noise decided to get in on it himself. After all, surely the leader of this community was the most mentally and spiritually sound member. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, those traits had to be passed along. Duh. So Noyes and his son Theodore fathered 12 children between them, 11 of whom survived. The 58 children born during the experiment were closely attended to and were, and were well educated. They were under constant guidance of older members of the community and many lived long and successful lives. So this whole stirpiculture thing is referred to on Wikipedia as the first instance of positive eugenics. In America. I would argue no. that's an oxymoron. Yeah, you can't have pos like, because this is where you get to be in like a slippery slope yeah. because you're like, well, that form of eugenics was fine. So, okay, we can twist like what the Nazis did to be fine because they yeah. weeded out all like people with disabilities and stuff. Yeah, exactly. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, that's why <laughs> I did not write in the script. This was a form of positive eugenics because it's not. It's no. It's literally this one guy like using his community members, his cult members, as like Ken and Barbie and pairing them up and making them go 
make babies and like it's creepy yeah. as fuck and him fathering you know a whole buttload of children as well but why you may ask did this experiment that seemed so successful in the eyes of their community not so much anyone else uh why did it only last for 10 years well times they were a change in and the oneida community was starting to rub some people the wrong way how it was just starting to we'll never know but alas uh <laughs> By the 1860s, the community had started a few offshoot groups in different locations. They had a small group in Brooklyn that ran a printing business and distributed noises teachings in print. Uh, and there was also a community in Wallingford, Connecticut. The United community had also greatly expanded their business endeavors. Their animal trap business, which, is, which had started out in the blacksmith shop with handcrafting, could now produce 300,000 traps per year. It's not bad going. Yeah. Uh, which made them lots of money. And late in the community's lifespan, they also started making and selling silver-plated cutlery when the fur trade began to slow down. Well, I suppose it's a similar... It's a similar um, manufacturing process. Yeah, it's a similar sort of skill set because it's... It's met it's all metal work, it's isn't metal it? Metal working. And it, I I would almost say that like stamping out pieces of silverware is probably an even easier manufacturing process than putting together animal traps. Mm. You know, like at least the silverware you don't really have to put stuff together. You just Yeah, there's no mechanics to it, is there? Yeah, exactly. Like, it doesn't like, have to do anything, it just has to be a pretty hunk of metal. Yeah, so when we're talking about animal traps, we're we talking about, like, bear trap type of things, I, like... I would guess, because... I couldn't figure this out, I think they're beaver traps, because they kept talking about the fur trade, and in the Northeast, the fur trade was mostly beaver. Okay. Um, so I have no concept of what a beaver trap looks like, and I'm quite scared to Google it. Yeah, I don't really want to look it up. Beavers are great, everyone. If you haven't watched the PBS documentary Leave It to Beavers, you should, because your life will be better for it. No, it was more the fact that I don't have safe search on Google and type in beaver trap. <laughs> this is where my mind's going after having, you know, read all this out. Okay, I'm really confused as to how it works, but it looks horrible and painful. Yeah. Um, but it does look to be of like a similar kind of snap design, like it snaps up. Yes, yeah. Around the beaver. Yes. Kind of like a Yeah, like a cartoon bear trap kind of thing. Okay. So yeah. They killed all the beavers, so they had to pivot their business. Mm. Yeah. And they were wildly successful. And of course, with success comes attention. Many outsiders became suspicious of the community's emphasis on free love and began to regard their system of complex marriage as polygamy. Which, we all know, once you call it polygamy, it ain't popular in America. <laughs> Just ask the Mormons. Also, interestingly, Joseph Smith started Mormonism around the same time in upstate New York. Oh, dear. So that's the interesting thing about American religious history is that, like, there was a lot of weird shit going on that like, kind of all at the same time that people don't mm. necessarily realize today. So lots of fun stuff there. So add to all of this that John Humphrey Noyes was getting old. Uh, and he wanted to hand over the day-to-day -day operation of the community to his son, Theodore, in order to ensure the community's survival and, obviously, the bloodline and all that great, terrible bullshit. So, when Noyes passed the torch to Theodore, things started to go really wrong. Because, much like his father was a bad lawyer, <laughs> Theodore was a bad leader. <laughs> and also, hey, didn't really want the job anyway. 
Uh, the transfer of power also divided the community and eventually led to a split. And one member, John Towner, attempted to gain control of the community for himself. And he was eventually cast out and led a group of former community members across the country to settle in California, where the governor granted Towner control of the newly formed Orange County. Oh, wow. This, uh, this story just, it touches all sides of the country. <laughs> <laughs> and then came pressure from the law. In New York, there was a reform movement happening in the 1870s. Anthony Comstock founded the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice and quickly set his sights on the freewheeling Oneida community. In 1879, Noyes heard a rumour that he would be arrested for breaking New York's marriage laws, so he fled to the Canadian side of Niagara Falls, and he would remain there until his death on April 13th, 1886. This left the community without a strong leader, and many of the younger members started showing signs of breaking with the traditions that they had been taught. Just like every generation rebels against their parents, the Oneida youth were no different. They didn't want to share their spouses with everyone else. They didn't want to get permission to have children. They wanted monogamy. So in 1879, the community's system of complex marriage was abandoned. Over the next year, over 70 members entered into traditional marriages. And perhaps more importantly, these members wanted capitalism. Yeah. Uh, the group voted in 1880 to dissolve the commune and transfer the communal property to a joint stock company called Oneida Community Limited. The company was formed in 1881 with former commune members owning shares. The newly formed company still retained some of the progressive views of the commune, including 11 female board members, but their main focus was the business. None, none of this communism. They wanted the cold hard cash. By 1899, they focused their production on the silverware business, and it began to grow exponentially. The company successfully adapted to the upheaval of the First and Second World Wars, uh, contributing to war efforts by expanding their manufacturing, and the post-war boom of babies and families only helped their business. Because what else says traditional family like gorgeous silverware? I mean, I've never gotten the appeal, but Go figure. I mean, I don't really care as long as it's clean. Yeah. Uh, by 1947, the company became aware that their origins as a free love commune stood at odds to their market position as peddlers of family tradition. Uh, so they decided the best option would be to burn Noise's records and attempt to erase the Oneida community from history. And the people making that decision were actually some of Noise's direct descendants. So. Which shows probably a hell of a lot of by that point. Yes, yeah, I, I'd imagine so. <laughs> Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, you know, there, there was bound to be quite a few of them. Nephew sons, niece daughters. Oh. oh. And so this this approach worked for a while. Uh, because a lot of the original records of the community were destroyed and have not been found elsewhere. And much of uh, what we know of the Oneida community today comes from diaries of original members, uh, especially the diaries of Noise's brother, George Noise, and Noise's niece, Tirza Miller. Uh, so by the 1980s, Oneida Limited produced nearly half of all flatware sold in America under various brand names and subsidiaries. The Oneida Mansion House was listed as a National Historic Landmark in 1965 and still stands today. It's now run by the state of New York as an educational organization that gives guided tours and hosts events and exhibitions, and they focus on preserving the material and social culture of the Oneida community for future generations. And that is the story of the Oneida community, an early cult that was both progressive and super horrifying. Wow. Yeah. Thoughts? Yuck. Pretty much, yeah. Um, nah, I just think it's fucking vile. It's pedophilia. Yeah. At the end of it, it 
to me, it doesn't matter what good you do if part of that belief and all the good that you do is based on raping children. Exactly. It's like, it's a lot of the literature about these guys very much tries to elevate these these quote-unquote good aspects that like women had more rights and you know whatever you know they but did they but because that's the thing yeah okay so you could sit on a board member but you're also being raped from the age of 10 exactly so like you had no say in who you had a relationship with or who you had a child with yeah, so if you if you then look at all of those quote unquote good things in the context of but from the start of a child's life within the community they were being sexually coerced and controlled by basically a creepy old guy who thought he was Jesus more or less. Mm. Like it just kind of all the air falls out of that argument. And it just, like, it seems to me that John Humphrey Noyes wasn't exactly the most mentally stable from from the get-go. No. And he just decided that he had figured out this whole, you know, heaven on earth thing and just kind of spread his crazy everywhere. Yeah. And once again, we're back to the whole blaming his mother for their weird ass relationship. Yes. Which happens with like every serial killer, every cult leader, every like male criminal, like prolific male criminal. It's, well, what did his mother do to make him this way? No, some men are just scum. Yeah. And like, in fact, you could argue with him. It wasn't until he left, you know, the, the, safety of his mother's world that he started really dipping into the nutball stuff of like the second coming mm. and and you know you raise your children the best you can and some of them turn out great and some of them turn out to be cult leaders so <laughs> what are you gonna do it's not her fault He's the one who she decided had, what, six she had six other children yeah, i'm she, sure some of them were fine she had a shit ton of children with with names and uh you know some of them were great probably apparently she resisted joining the community for many years mm. um and basically thought that her son was nuts and a heretic uh and then eventually he wore her down and she joined but by all accounts, like she was not pleased with that decision. I think it is it is a good example of how people or why people join cults. Mm -hmm. Because they say it started as this commune, which was, you know, about living your best life. Yeah. Um, everyone pitched in, everyone did the work, all of that. And it slowly it wasn't like an overnight thing. No, it really wasn't. It, was very slow burn and that's how cults work because yeah. we talked about this last week when we said you can't just walk up to someone and say right the government is being led by a race of lizard people mm -hmm. who live in the sewers and sacrifice children yeah <laughs> so let's see let's 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 put that into the context of this episode i i walk up to you and say um hey let me tell you about Jesus Christ. He already showed up 34 years after he died. And so we're living uh, the heavenly afterlife. You're not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. We're all perfect. Let's all fuck. It's not an easy sell. <laughs> no. If someone came up to me and said that in the street, I'd be like, please go away. Yes. <laughs> Do you need me to call the psych ward for you, sir? And then if you take that even further, like, oh, but we have all these, like, weird rules about sex. But also, children have to be initiated at the age of 10. Yeah. That's the hard sell. Yeah. And that's the thing, like, so by all accounts, well, because they couldn't afford 
to raise children as a group at at the beginning. And it was mm-hmm. only once these children that had been born had started to grow up. So I don't I think that that all that stuff kind of didn't start until like the mid 1850s. So you've got like 10 years between yeah. really the start of the community and mm. and the, yeah, the sort of growing up. And it it is it's like the bigger it got, the more power noise had. How does it always go? It gets crazier. Yeah. But yeah, to to me it doesn't matter what you did they were about sexually assaulting children and controlling women. Yeah. That's what it boils down to. So and literal no. literal eugenics. Yeah. Like like actual eugenics. Like that's fuck that. Wild. And that and then yet somehow they managed to turn themselves into like an incredibly successful corporation and completely yeah. erase the knowledge of their history really into like the mm. 1990s. Yeah, that that is quite impressive it really is considering all the shit they were up to Mm. um there's a great book and it's it's by one of a a descendant from an original community member and it's called oneida from free love utopia to the well-set table by ellen Whalen smith um and yeah it's so she's a descendant and she goes into the whole history and it's like wild. So, yeah. That's our yeah. first cult. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say. I don't. Um, but do let us know what you think. Uh, if you happen to know the name of the noises, names of the noise siblings, then let me know. Cause there's literally like 20 different options and, it's too too challenging for me to sift through. That's it for this week. I think we can do a, a yay or nay vote. We should do a yay or nay vote on all these cult episodes. Do we think they were a cult? <laughs> yes. Yes, I agree. Definitely a cult. Old timey, creepy, pedophilic, eugenic cult. Evil. So, on that note, if you like the show, please be sure to rate and review us on your podcast app, uh, especially Apple Podcasts, and subscribe to us so you never miss a new episode. Please do share this episode with a friend you think might like it, and be sure to tell us your thoughts on social media, or even, hear me out, via email, uh, because we would really love to read out some of your thoughts in future episodes. Uh, so in order to do that, you could email us uh, and you can write to us at info at squaremileofmurder.com. This week, or last week, the uh, Pod- British Podcast Awards announced their nominations. We didn't enter into any of the categories because anthology pods just don't win awards. It's the nature of the show. We don't really care. However, it also costs to enter. That's yes. the bit that was the real sticking point yeah. for us. Uh, however... There is the Listener's Choice Award, which every podcast in Britain gets entered into, and it is a listener's vote, as the name suggests. (laughs) So, if you have two minutes to spare and would like to vote for us, you can go to britishpodcastawards.com forward slash vote. There's a little search box, you just type in Square Mile of Murder, you have to put your email address in and they'll send you a link. You click on the link and that's your vote confirmed. You can opt out of all like the newsletters and stuff, which I keep forgetting to do. And yeah, because we would really like to not come last. Yeah. I mean, we would really like to win, but we don't have enough listeners yet. No. But if you share this episode with your friends, <laughs> maybe we will. Maybe one, yeah. Uh, we'll put the link to that in the show notes and on the web page for this episode. So if you happen to find yourself in any of those places or like our Instagram bio link, then you can yeah. just check it out right from there and if you would like to help us cover the costs of making the podcast and help us invest in the future of the show so that one day we can win (laughs) you can join our patreon page tiers start at just one pound per month every patron gets regular episodes a day early a shout out on the show priority case requests and a lifetime merch discount 
and that's just for one pound a month as the tiers go up you get even more including bonus episodes and exclusive money can't buy merch so check that out at patreon.com forward slash square mile of murder links are in all the usual places we'll be back next week yeah with another cult yeah i'm very excited we will see you then yep bye, bye.